Okay, good morning. Um, today's topic uh, is probably something which has kept you awake at night for the majority of your life. Reasons for species diversity in tropical rainforests. And this is part of BIOL 3465, Tropical Forest Ecology and Use. Apologies um, for those of you doing biodiversity and conservation. There are some repeats in this lecture, but I think a little bit of reinforcement never hurt anybody, did it? And I'll also go into a little bit more depth in this lecture than I did in biodiversity. So what I want to take a look at, diversity in tropical rainforests, the situation. I want to take a look at some of the historical models which explain diversity in tropical rainforest. And then I want to take a look at some of the current processes which maintain the diversity uh, in tropical rainforests, uh, the equilibrium models and the non-equilibrium models. And then finally take a look at non-tree tropical rainforest diversity. Throughout this lecture, I'm going to be concentrating on the diversity of tropical trees in tropical rainforests. As we've seen before, trees are the main element of tropical rainforests. Not only are they the main element, but they, in terms of biomass, they underpin all the other diversity that you get in a tropical rainforest. So if you have a low diversity tropical rainforest, chances are, or you're very likely to have a very low diversity non-tree um, biota as well. So the underlying cause of the high diversity situation in tropical rainforests is the high diversity of tropical trees. So let's take a look at why there is such a high diversity of tropical trees. What is the situation? First of all, um, as you've probably all heard before, tropical rainforests are the most species diverse ecosystems on Earth. Here's a picture of um, El Tacuch from Las Cuevas Ridge. Um, nice tropical rainforest there. In this field of view, there are probably hundreds of species of trees in that one little view. So we have a very high diversity of trees. Tree diversity is probably about five times higher in a tropical forest compared to a temperate forest uh, with you know, the highest diversity temperate forests uh, which occur maybe in the southeastern United States although I think the temperate forests in southern China are, are getting pretty diverse as well. But it's about tropical forests are uh, five times to order of magnitude higher in diversity um, why is this the case? Um, this lecture we're going to go through some of the reasons for that. So other interesting facts about diversity. Over half of the global biodiversity is contained in tropical forest ecosystems. Primary producers, i.e. the trees, underpin all this biodiversity. And trees are those dominant primary producers. So they not only import the majority of the primary production, the carbohydrates and all of that sort of stuff into the ecosystem, but they provide the structure as well. So here we have some nice trees, very important, uh, nice spectacular animals like these scarlet macaws rely on the trees. No trees, no macaws. Remember that. All right. So what makes tropical rainforests so biodiverse? And why are trees so biodiverse? Well, the start of the story is way back in time. The stability time hypothesis but speculate tropical forests have not been disturbed by glaciation and therefore have more taxa uh, and more species have had a chance to evolve. So all those mutations have had a chance to accumulate uh, for pretty much all taxa um, because they haven't been disturbed. So here is a representation of the earth at the height of the last glaciation. Uh, you can see all the nice ice sheets coming down from the north and taking out the northern part of the uh, northern hemisphere landscape. Southern hemisphere not that much affected, just um, 
parts of the Andes there and a part of uh, southeastern Australia and New Zealand but generally the tropics no glaciation there was probably some glaciation up in the high mountains areas there's probably some glaciers further up in Papua New Guinea there oh look they've got Australia joined to Papua New Guinea wonderful so tropical forests less disturbed by glaciers and so on now glaciers as you can imagine if you had tons of ice above your head you are not going to survive so a lot of these temperate ecosystems underneath the glaciers would have been totally annihilated and even the temperate ecosystems outside of those glacial areas would have been severely changed because they would be much much cooler and much colder than they are today so we would find that um, tropical ecosystems are some of the least changed but there is likely to have been at least some change even in tropical ecosystems and the reason why people think that is because when you look at glaciers on tropical mountains um, you can see evidence that they were much further down the mountainside they occurred at much lower altitudes than they do today and that means that the temperatures must have been colder even in the tropics now if we have cooler temperatures in the tropics that can have a direct effect on uh, the vegetation so cooler weather will have um, an important effect on the vegetation in terms of um, reducing evaporative load um, but also in, there may be frosts and frosts are a big killer of plants plants have to have specific uh, adaptations to survive frosts so the cooler temperatures would have changed species distribution um, alongside the coastal regions that probably wouldn't have been so much of an impact but in the interior of continents you may have had frost developing where you don't get frost today because as you know the interior of continents will tend to heat up and cool down much more than coastal regions because the oceans act as a big heat sink and they will keep the adjacent land warm but in the middle of the land uh, there is a lot more temperature range also on the fringes of these mountains there would be a lot more frosts and cooler weather as you go up in altitude so you would have had changes in temperature across the tropics and they would have had an effect but what is thought the main effect or the biggest effect of a reduction in temperature um, would have had on tropical rainforests is due to a reduction in rainfall so when you have lower temperatures in a tropical region that usually means less moisture in the atmosphere less evaporation and that will mean less rainfall so there would have to be a shift in the tropical rainforest ecosystems to ecosystems which are much more tolerant to seasonal drought and it's thought that um, large blocks of rainforest which occur today back during the height of the last ice age may have broken up into smaller patches which were more likely to have received rainfall throughout the year for whatever reason I mean the foothills of the Andes mountain probably received more rainfall due to orographic effects and there are other parts of the Amazon basin which are hypothesized to have received more and constant rainfall and they are thought to have represented rainforest refugia so the majority of the rainforest would have turned into tropical dry forest or like this tropical savanna here in parts of uh, the modern day Amazon so rainforests were thought to have been disrupted okay the model for this disruption 
has been modified over time. Nobody is disputing that the tropics were colder and rainfall patterns were modified, but evidence gathered to try and support this rain, rainforest refugia hypothesis um, using pollen cores uh, to try and represent what sort of vegetation communities there were in particular areas of the Amazon basin have not borne out this extreme contraction of the rainforest and replacement by savanna vegetation over the whole of the Amazon basin. Instead, what has been found is a, retra a retraction of tropical rainforest, but by no means to the same extent as that all of these blocks have been fragmented. Instead, uh, it's thought that many of these blocks were still part of a large block of rainforest, but certain areas, like there is a corridor which runs up through Guyana, which is thought to have uh, reverted to savanna um, because it is in more of a rain shadow from the Guyanan highlands, the Surinamese and French Guyanan and Guyana highlands. So it's thought that this, uh, the Grand Savannas in eastern Venezuela extended further south almost to the Amazon River there. But the vast majority of tropical rainforest in the Amazon basin and on the Guyana Shield remained intact. And even in those areas where savanna did uh, encroach upon uh, tropical savanna, sorry, tropical rainforest, uh, there were still patches of rainforest along the rivers and in swamps, uh, so that when the glacial period ended, um, these rainforests rapidly spread back out across the landscape. Blah, blah, blah. We talked about that. Okay, so the thing to note is that in temperate ecosystems, they were radically changed both through temperature and through being covered in tons of ice. Uh, so that in many cases, the ecosystems that you find there today have only been in existence since the end of the last ice age. And many of the plants which occur in those ecosystems today would have had to have come from the outside. So you can actually see that even today, about 10,000 years after the end of the last ice age, there are still uh, species expanding their range in the temperate regions and still species invading in the temperate regions. So the species composition and the species distribution in temperate regions is still changing even after 10,000 years. So this is particularly the case for long generation time trees and so on. So for instance, sycamore trees in uh, the United Kingdom, the UK, in Britain, the sycamore trees uh, had a historical increase in their range. They moved northwards through England throughout the 1800s and 1900s. So they're an example of a species which was still expanding or is, and is still expanding uh, even today. And there are other species like that which still haven't arrived but when they do they begin to extend expand. The same is the case in the North American continent. You still have species expanding across the landscape. In tropical rainforest, that situation is much less, mainly because the most of the tropical rainforest uh, did not change that much. They may have got a higher proportion of deciduous species in places, but generally the forest remained. Species would have spread from wetter parts of the landscape in, in certain parts of the tropics which were changed to savanna, but generally the number of species remained. Now this meant that all those mutations, all those species which were accumulated would have been maintained. In temperate ecosystems they would have been wiped out and they would have had to have been replaced 
by species invading again from the south. In tropical rainforest ecosystems, on the other hand, the species were there and they survived. And so many species which have built up over the millions of years that tropical rainforests have been in existence would still be around. So that is basically why people think that tropical rainforests or the historical region uh, reason or the origin of the high diversity of tropical rainforest and in particular tropical rainforest trees um, how it arose where it came from now I want to talk about how it is maintained what are the current ecological processes which are going on which explained how diversity is maintained because it's one thing to uh, understand the origin of that diversity building up over time over millions of years but how is that diversity maintained today particularly in the face of one of the central uh, ideas of ecology which is that competition will drive a reduction in diversity in any ecosystem so one of the central tenets of um, ecology is that if you have two species whose niche requirements or use of resources overlap to any great extent one of those species is going to drive the other species to extinction you probably learnt about this in Fundamentals of Ecology. Now many of the trees in a tropical rainforest have almost completely overlapping re resource requirements. They all need light, water and nutrients and they all will try and get that light, water and nutrients from the environment. So how is it then that there is such a high diversity of trees in these tropical rainforests if they are all using the same resources. Surely the most competitive tree will capture all the resources and drive all the other spe less competitive species out of the ecosystem or to extinction. So what we have effectively is a series of models which try and explain why these competition, this competition hypothesis does not seem to apply in tropical rainforests and in particular in tropical rainforest trees. So the first um, model which is uh, used is that the trees are actually partitioned along environmental gradients which are very either very obvious or very su subtle and cryptic okay first of all some of the obvious environmental gradients in which species may be separated out along I'll use a Trinidad example in the Trinidad uh, lowland rainforest which is called an evergreen seasonal rainforest in other words, it is uh, evergreen forest. It keeps green leaves throughout the year. It's not deciduous. Uh, but there is a period of the year where rainfall is pretty absent for about three months. Not too long to, for the, all, these leaves to, um, all these trees to drop their leaves, but long enough to have an effect. There is partitioning of species along environmental gradients and the classic example is between carapa or the crapo tree and eshwellera or the water care tree these are two of the most common species in these trinidad forests these lowland evergreen seasonal forests and they tend to partition out in the landscape along a moisture gradient the carapa or the crapo tree will tend to congregate or have their greatest abundance 
in valley bottoms um, or in lowland areas where moisture tends to be concentrated so they like the wetter end of the spectrum. The Guatacare or Eshwalera tree which is a relative of the Brazil nut by the way in the Lacitidae family it tends to concentrate in the drier parts of the landscape along ridge tops and more well-drained areas of the habitat. So you would get a partitioning therefore of these two species. So you would also find other species which would show that sort of partitioning as well. They prefer drier, more well-drained sites and other trees would uh, prefer uh, heavier soils, more clay soils with more moisture throughout the year. So you would find species partitioning in the landscape using these gradients and this may occur to a greater or lesser extent and this certainly contributes to biodiversity. But there are species, so for instance you would have a whole suite of species, a whole slew of different species which occur on ridge tops. Why doesn't Eshwalera just outcompete all of those ridgetop species? Why doesn't it uh, eliminate them? So there must be some, according to these um, gap partitioning hypotheses or niche partitioning hypotheses, there may be some other uh, environmental gradient which is being partitioned up so each species would concentrate on one particular part of that gradient. Okay, So the idea is that the stability of the environment in a tropical rainforest allows competitive exclusion to four species to specialize and pack niches along a resource continuum. And where this competition is most likely to occur is at the tree seedling stage and that's where the greatest mortality of trees is and therefore the most likely place where one uh, species is going to outcompete and force another species out. So the idea is that different tree seedlings specialize in different micro environments. Now this may be the case um, it has not been demonstrated conclusively as yet. So for instance, if we do have a ridgetop environment, for example, uh, it hasn't been conclusively shown that the different species which occur on ridgetops tend to specialize in particular microenvironments. It's not to say that they don't, it's just that we don't have the technology and we don't have the ability to separate the microenvironments on those ridge tops into the microenvironments which are the ecologically important ones which the different tree species do specialize in. So it could be that if we look at uh, different areas of the forest floor which have different concentrations of sun flex and therefore intensities of light in different um, times of the year and that in combination with some micro uh, environment variation in soil moisture due to you know dips and hollows in the, um, the ridge top those two combinations of factors may create microenvironments in which we would find the species, the same species of tree seedlings consistently. So, for instance, if we have an area which has a high density of sunflex and a relatively high soil moisture content uh, through much of the year we may consistently find a particular tree species seedling in that environment. And by the same token, if we have a microenvironment which has lower, um, lower densities of sunflex, uh, 
and maybe a drier part, a little ridge on the ridge top, which is even more well drained and even more drier, then it could be that we would find a different species consistently in that type of microenvironment. So it could be the case, but nobody has definitively proven that this is the case. And I think it's mainly because nobody has really divided up the microclimates uh, to show this. Uh, it may be something which we could do here in Trinidad. Certainly, um, nobody has shown this in the understory of a tropical rainforest. It has been shown, however, in gaps. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about gaps a little bit later on. Okay, but tree fall gaps, in fact, I probably should talk about it now. Uh, where is these tree fall gaps? Right. So gap stage species are extreme examples of, um, of uh, species which concentrate on a particular microenvironment. Uh, these gaps are temporary changes in microenvironment, as you all know, uh, which occur and we have species which have particular, evolved particular traits more in morphology and behavior which make us call them our selected species but make them much more suitable to uh, adopt gaps um, as their preferred means of of living okay so gaps would have a high amount of resources which these species can use so these species would are evolved to utilize these gaps and they're evolved to be able to utilize the high amount of resources but also to disperse their offspring so that they can find these gaps but I'm going to talk about gaps a little bit later where was I up to um, yeah we talked about that gap partitioning Stability, right. Gap partitioning propose that species are separated on environmental gradients, may be obvious or subtle and cryptic. It could be also that some species of seedlings are to, uh, specialize in large gaps and some species specialize in small gaps. Okay, so here we have a, a tree fall gap. We have a small tree fall gap and a large tree fall gap. Some species may specialize in large tree fall gaps where there is a large amount of light, and some species may specialize in smaller tree fall gaps where there is a smaller amount of light. So in this way, different tree species are able to partition up environmental gradients and are able to um, avoid competition and therefore avoid forcing each other out of the ecosystem. Right, okay, so moving on now. Right, the next um, hypothesis which has been proposed to explain why there is uh, a high diversity of tree species is, and to explain why competition doesn't four species out of the ecosystem uh, is the compensatory mortality hypothesis. And this proposes higher mortality for more numerous species uh, and therefore more competitive species due to higher predation. So the idea is that if a species is particularly good at um, utilizing the resources, uh, it increases in number. Now because, uh, as we saw with uh, herbivory and predation, uh, many of these trees have uh, got insects and um, other parasites or herbivores which need to specialize in that particular species because uh, they need to be able to overcome the um, 
the uh, the secondary compounds and the defenses of that particular species so they specialize their morphology and their physiology to be able to do that so each species has host specific predators and herbivores so if a particular species increases in number to any great extent then that there will be a um, equivalent increase in the herbivores and predators which prey on that particular species so eventually the large numbers will of of the tree um, seedlings would lead to large numbers of their predators and the large numbers of their predators would uh, force uh, the reduction in population of that particular tree species so in theory then that the most competitive species would be held in check by uh, predation and the example I've got here is this is a carapa tree or crapo tree there are the seeds there and the leaves and the overall form and this picture is the worm or the larvae of a moth and this moth is known as Hypsipyla H Y S P um, no H Y hip H Y P S I S Y S I P Sipala H Y P S I P I L A Hipsipala. Um, I'm not too sure whether I got the Y's and the I's uh, correct there, but this moth um, lays its eggs on the seed pods of the crapo tree, and the grubs hatch out and they burrow into the seeds and parasitize the seeds and eat the seeds. Uh, this Hypsipyla moth, the same Hypsipyla moth, also preys on uh, the seeds and the roots and the shoots, sorry, not the roots, the shoots, and particularly the growing tips of cedar trees and mahogany trees, both of which are in the Meliaceae family along with the Carapa tree. Whenever there's a high density or a, a high number of seeds of crapo tree, the Hypsipyla moth will come along and um, or whenever it's fruiting, the tree is fruiting, the moth will come along, lay its eggs uh, on the pods so that the grubs will infect the seeds. And this means that there is almost 99% mortality of the young seedlings underneath the tree. So even though crapo trees have very uh, fairly large seeds and they're quite dominant, they are never able to take over the forest because the Hypsipyla moth keeps all the seedlings in check. So that's the compensatory mortality hypothesis. And we're going to talk about um, a species which seems to escape from this process, uh, the Mora tree in Trinidad in our next lecture. Okay, another reason why it is thought that um, trees can e coexist together is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And this proposes that uh, competitive exclusion is not allowed to occur uh, or go to its logical conclusion because disturbance always occurs before the dominant species is able to force all the other species out. And there are different ways in which um, a rainforest can be disturbed. The most common way is tree fall gaps and tree fall gaps are thought to be uh, one of the disturbances which allow different species to occur in a tropical rainforest. And certainly those are selected species which occur in gaps, uh, need those gaps and need that intermediate disturbance to be able to survive.
but the numbers or the importance of those gap stage species uh, does tend to be a bit overstated in a tropical forest. In terms of numbers of species, those gap stage species represent less than 10% or less than 15% of the total number of species of trees in a tropical forest. So 85 to 90% of the trees in a tropical forest do not rely on gaps and do not use a gap part of the resource continuum. So the gap stage or the gap intermediate disturbance um, explanation for uh, increased diversity isn't really relevant to 85 to 90 percent of species of trees in a tropical forest. So it's thought that these um, intermediate disturbance hypothesis is not really that important in tropical forests. Now why have I got a, a picture of a river here? Well another type of intermediate disturbance uh, which has been identified occurs on uh, river floodplains. Uh, rivers as you all know are not static. They are continually um, meandering or moving across the flat floodplain as um, the outsides of bends are eroded away because of the fluid dynamics of the water and the insides of the bends are built up so the river would migrate across the floodplain. As it migrates across the floodplain it destroys parts of ecosystems and creates ecosystems on the other side. And this effectively is a periodic disturbance. Any point on this floodplain would probably be disturbed by a river uh, every 100 to 200 years or so. This is a regular enough disturbance so that some species have evolved to take advantage of this and um, uh, they regenerate after a river meander has disturbed the forest. Uh, this tree is a, this is a picture of a tree called Octomeles sumatrama. Uh, this is in Papua New Guinea and really large individuals of this tree spring up um, on the uh, river sandy river bars which are created on the insides of these meanders and they form forests which are huge with these huge trees okay and um, but they cannot regenerate underneath themselves so uh, their seedlings cannot survive and they must wait until a river comes close again and destroys the forest before they can regenerate. The forest is lower diversity than a forest which is more stable but it includes species that you're not going to get in a more stable environment because they rely on this intermediate disturbance. Alright so we talked about gap stage species and so on. Alright now all of those models or hypotheses which I have just mentioned all work on the hypothesis that the competitive exclusion um, is one of the most dominant ecological processes in a tropical rainforest and there must be reasons why it is counted um, but it will still continue if uh, allowed to now there's another school of thought which is gaining a lot of um, credence and that is the non-equilibrium models. Now these models propose that competitive exclusion is not an overriding force in tropical rainforest ecosystems and that species that use the same resources can coexist pretty much due to the random nature of dispersal disturbance and regeneration and the name given to this is called the neutral theory. Now what this theory um, describes 
is that uh, the composition of a tropical rainforest community is determined purely by chance. So whether or not a species occurs in a particular area of tropical forest is completely by chance. And the reason for that is that um, random events lead to the regeneration of species in that particular area. So we cannot predict when there will be a tree fall gap in that area. We cannot predict whether a seed will be carried and land of a particular species and be present in that uh, particular part of the forest. We cannot predict um, which species will be living in that particular spot when the gap is created. And because of all the unpredictabilities of these ecological events, which are very important to regeneration, no one species can develop traits that allow it to competitively exclude others. So it's much like um, transferring of genes from one generation to the next generation. Because uh, the process of transfer of genes um, into gametes and so on is essentially random, um, as long as you have a large enough population, all the genes from one generation will be passed on to the next generation. Because there will be a large enough population, so randomly all the genes will be transferred over. It's the same in a tropical rainforest. Because of the random nature of tree fall gaps and regeneration opportunities and dispersal, you are not going to get any one species being able to develop behaviors and morphologies which can uh, allow them to specialize in resources uh, that come available in that particular spot. So one species may be favored over, uh, on one occasion and a next species may be favored on the next occasion. So that on that particular part of the forest it could be any species which can colonize. But simply because of chance one uh, seedling survived and the other one didn't. Okay, so the non-equilibrium models or the neutral theory uh, says that the composition of the forest is essentially random and that competitive um, forcing of the composition of the species of the rainforest is non-existent and that it does not uh, matter that much because there's too much unpredictability and no one species can become totally uh, dominant through competition. Okay, So I've been talking mainly about the reasons why tropical tree diversity tends to be high. But there is, of course, more than just trees living in a tropical forest. Although trees form the major structural components, uh, they can themselves form different microclimates and food sources, which may be specialized on it by smaller um, organisms in a tropical rainforest, like the animals, the insects, the epiphytes, and so on. So different species of tree will give different microclimates and different microenvironments, which different species of animals and even epiphytes can specialize in. So it is no surprise then that the greater the diversity of trees, the greater the diversity of microenvironments and therefore the greater the diversity of the non-tree organisms in the rainforest. And in fact, because the tree diversity is so high, then uh, the number of niches to specialize in is so high because of different food sources and different structures and so on, that different species of animals and plants can specialize in those different niches 
And because there is usually more than one niche to every tree species, then those specializations mean that the small animals in particular, like the insects, uh, will tend to be the most species taxa in a tropical rainforest. So although the primary producers, and in particular the trees, are the reason why there is high diversity in a tropical rainforest, it is not the trees which are the most diverse taxa. It is the arthropods or the insects which take that title. So diversity in a tropical rainforest is very high. Primary producers underpin it, but it's the animals which can specialize in the smaller niches which really benefit the most from all that diversity. Okay, so that's the end of that lecture. I will talk about a specific example in Trinidad in the next lecture, uh, which is goes against all the ecological equilibrium uh, arguments uh, of why you should have uh, high diversity. So it's an exception to the rule, an interesting exception, uh, which I've studied, so I'm going to share some of my research with you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.